and to have with us the true rich heaven. And let me tell you just a little bit about him and why it is this particular topic is so apropos to his experience. And he was born in St. Louis, Missouri, and moved to California in 1956. He graduated from uh, Cal State College at Long Beach in 1966. Uh, during one of his summer breaks in college, he attended the Marine Corps Officer Candidate School in Chronicle, and he applied and was accepted to flight training at the Naval uh, Aviation School. Upon graduation from college, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the United States Marine Corps. Thank you, Chris. Thank you for your service. He received his Naval Aviator Wings in September of 1967. Went through the training uh, requisite to becoming a, a helicopter pilot in the CH-56 Sea Knight. He was deployed to Okinawa and then further on to South Vietnam in 1968. He was assigned to the Marine Medium Helicopter Squadron MM-HNM 262. And he proceeded to serve out his 13 months of duty where he flew over, or he flew approximately 680 combat mission supports. So, I mean, 680 is a lot. So, one more hand. Thank you. Thank you. Here he is today to share with us about Marine Corps Aviation and Helicopter Ops in Vietnam. Great job. Great. Thank you, Tim. Appreciate it. Thank, you. Thank you all for showing up. I really appreciate this. I didn't expect this large of a turnout. Um, uh, Greg gave you my background here, but uh, we've been coming, my wife and I, uh, have been coming to the Air Museum for the last 10 years, and uh, uh, which we really enjoy, and we enjoyed going to these presentations on Saturday afternoon. And these were introduced to us by some good friends of ours, uh, Karen and Lyle Olson. Raise your hands up back there, Karen and Lyle. Thank you. And, uh, but during those 10 years, I've never seen a presentation on the Marine Corps or Marine Corps aviation, and specifically Marine Corps helicopters. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, the brochure came out today has all Army helicopters on it. And uh, <laughs> I said, well, what the heck? Uh, and uh, there's a reason for this. The Army was a much larger organization than Marine Corps. Had much greater presence in Vietnam. They had, at the height, uh, 355,000 troops, which included your the helicopters, and the Marine Corps had about 84. They were four and a half times the size, had 10 times the helicopters, and uh, they did a great job. They had a, a different system based on cavalry operations. We had an amphibious system. We were used to working off ships, assaulting an area and being relieved. So that, we had to adapt to that. Uh, and we had a, a, a number of helicopters totally different than the Army. And we'll get into that as we go along. Um, before I go uh, too much further, I want to give a warning that I practiced this with my, this presentation with my wife, my son-in-law, my grandson, and uh, I find myself choking up once in a while. And I don't want to start right off the bat doing that, but if I do, give me a second and I'll regain. Uh, there's a lot of things you, uh, over many years, over 50 years or so, that uh, you don't even think about. You're, you're, even when you're over there, you're desensitized. Uh, and it lasts for a number of years. And then all of a sudden, something does something in your brain. Your brain tries to protect you, but now I'm a human being again, basically. So, uh, also, we have some guests here I want to introduce. I'm uh, very happy to have a uh, uh, gentleman named Don Esmond. Don, if you'd stand up, please, for a second. Uh, Don has his family here with him, his wife, Cheryl, son, Chris, his granddaughters, Adriana and Raquel. You don't have to stand up. I don't know. But uh, Don uh, served in the same squadron that I did, HMM-262, uh, and uh, flew the same helicopter. But uh, we missed each other. Uh, and I was gone by the time he got there. Don had a, uh, an impressive and perilous tour in Vietnam. He shot down twice, uh, awarded the Silver Star, Distinguished Flying Cross, and the Purple Heart. 
and you don't get those for nothing. Okay, so we got a short period of time here to get through this, and I'm going to wing it today because I found out I put too much detail in it. Uh, but uh, uh, at the there will be a question and answer period at the end. I appreciate everyone hold uh, their questions till the end. And I've got Don here too that can uh, help out with the uh, questions. Uh, again, the presentation is about the uh, Marine Corps helicopters and Marine Corps helicopter operations in South Vietnam, spanning uh, approximately from 1962 to 1975. And we'll talk about the inventory, helicopter inventory uh, that we used over there. And I'm going to go through those by the date of entry into Vietnam and the types of missions we flew, the conditions under which we flew, topography, ground cover, weather, all that sort of thing. Now, uh, the presentation is not an attempt to justify the war or establish whether it was a right course of action or a not course of action. Everyone can make up their own mind on that. But I will add a few historical uh, details along the way. But I can't do too much of it because it takes too long. I only have probably 50 minutes now to get through this. Um, so. Here we go, if I can remember how to use this thing. Uh, first of all, I will start off with a Viet Vietnam uh, as it was uh, when I went there into North and South Vietnam. It's divided right at the 17th parallel here due to the uh, Geneva Accords. Uh, uh, the Geneva Accords happened after the French were defeated up here at DNB and Phu by the Viet Minh uh, communists. And uh, they took over, and the major powers in some of the smaller countries, major powers, US, UK, France, Soviet Union, China, and Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, etc., came together and put together what was known as the Geneva Accords, which, uh, for, among other things, divided the country at the 17th parallel. This was supposed to be a temporary situation. In 1956, two years later, they were supposed to have elections where the population of the countries could decide on what form of government they wanted. Well, it didn't happen. Uh, and uh, there was incursions from the north into the south and vice versa. So it never happened. And uh, so starting in uh, 1955, we started sending military advisors to South Vietnam because the uh, Viet Cong and that sort of thing were, were uh, quite active down in the south at that time. Um, by the way, here's Saigon down here, was, was a major city in South Vietnam, uh, down by the, Del uh, the Mekong Delta, and Hanoi was up here. Saigon is now called Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, da Nang was the second big city in South Vietnam, which was right up here. The Marines operated up here in the northern section South Vietnam. Now these red arrows, what they represent is the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Uh, we only had a 45 uh, mile uh, border at the top, but we had a 550 mile side door to South Vietnam, which made it a uh, difficult place to operate in. By the way, the f first helicopters going into uh, marine helicopters going into South Vietnam happened right down here in the Mekong Delta. By the way, Mekong Delta is the, the most productive rice growing area in the world. Uh, so we go on the first deployment of marine helicopters. Actually from um, March 1962 to December of 64, uh, we we're going in there to support uh, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, that, that, that's the South Vietnamese Army, uh, we call them ARVINs. There's a lot of acronyms in the military. And uh, we're supposed to be out by December of 64. And I'll tell you what happened, because we weren't, didn't, we didn't leave. And so the first aircraft was this aircraft right here, the Sikorsky CH-34 Delta Seahorse. It's a 1950s aircraft, a piston-driven radial engine. It's basically the same engine you have in the T-28 out there. Uh, Here's a, an actual uh, CH-34. It sort of looks like a great big ugly grasshopper. <laughs> Helicopters aren't too pretty usually. Uh, and uh, it was a, uh, quite a, a, a 
good aircraft, dependable, but the engine was up here in front, which also made for a good bullet stop, stopper. Pilots and uh, co-pilots sat up here in the front. By the way, the you know, Marine Corps and the Navy, the pilot in command, which is known as a helicopter aircraft commander or a hack, sat in the, in the uh, right seat. Co-pilots sat in the left seat, different than the, uh, the Air Force or even airline and, and all that sort of thing. And the compartment is right down here uh, where the troops could bark and disembark. And uh, they had, uh, this was a tail rotor aircraft. Uh, it uh, was uh, used for troop lifts, resupply, uh, medevacs, that sort of thing. You see in the background here uh, a fixed wing aircraft that that was a South Vietnamese Air Force aircraft. It was a, a uh, uh, Douglas, I think it was Douglas, yeah, Douglas A-1 uh, Sky Raider. And it was a great attack aircraft. But they also used, the Air, uh, South Vietnamese Air Force also used the uh, North, uh, uh, what is it, North American T-28 Trojan. I don't know how that on my in the North American T-28 Trojan, uh, which they also used uh, for close air support. Now, the problem was that uh, they, although they were good at attack aircraft, they couldn't be as precise as you needed when you went into a, what we call a hot landing zone. You're under fire. And uh, they didn't have the Huey gunships then. Uh, they tried to, to, uh, to uh, make one of these into a gunship, but they weren't very effective. The first Hueys didn't come in uh, to South Vietnam until 1963. Uh, the, uh, the Army had the UH-1A and the UH-1B, and the 1Bs were gunships. And by the way, the Army beat us to South Vietnam by three months, and they worked up out of Saigon area. And uh, in 1963, the Marines moved up to work with the Army up in the Saigon area. And that's when the, the UH-1Bs came in the country, which we'll get into uh, show you our version of the Huey, and escorted the Marine helicopters also, and the Marines liked them. So uh, they got, they ordered some of those. Now, here's a, this is an area called Sock Trang, that's where the first Marine helicopters went to. They're conducting a, a troop assault. I don't know what the objective was, but see all the rice paddies. So, whoop, here's the, Here's a medevac, these are for medevacs, and uh, resupply, in this case it's moving a piece of equipment here, but uh, resupply, and uh, this is an example of all the helicop helicopters, including the one I flew, how we did resupply, it's externally. And uh, you can put it internally, but that means you gotta take time in a land, in a zone to unload them uh, manually. So with a sling on there, you could just drop them, they call it pickling the load. Uh, you could either do it from the cockpit or the crew chief. And uh, sometimes you had to release that load quickly uh, to get in and out to reduce your exposure to a hot zone. Well, March, uh, for, March uh, the first one, 62 uh, to 64, I call phase one. There are actually four phases of this war. March of 1965 to June of 1971. For the Marine Corps, that was the war. Uh, we were out of there by June of 1971. The Army remained until 73. But uh, uh, this is in two parts. I don't want to get into too much detail. But it's actually, it's the buildup, we went into Danang 1965 with 3,500 Marines. And by the, by the end of 1965, there were uh, approximately 180,000 troops in South Vietnam. Uh, and uh, including uh, Marine Army, Air Force, Navy. And uh, it built up until the acme of the war, which is around 1968-1969, when we had uh, over 500,000 troops in uh, South Vietnam. The Marines had 84,000, the Army had 355,000. Then uh, President Johnson decided not to run. Was a, the war became very unpopular. Richard Nixon ran as the president who was going to end the war, and he was elected in uh, November of 
68, inaugurated 69, and he started what was known as the Vietnamization of the war. And uh, that was the wind down for us and the Army and everyone, because he was gradually going to turn us over to the South Vietnamese Army and government. Does that sound familiar to you? Uh, so the Marines were out of there by June, but we'll take it step by step. Let's talk about the, the other aircraft uh, the Marines used. This is the, the Bell UH-1E Huey. Uh, the Army had the UH-1B. And this is basically the same aircraft, uh, except it had a couple of modifications. Aluminum body, so it wouldn't corrode around salt water because we designed to work off of ships. It had a different electrical system and radios, and it had a, a rotor brake, which you needed if you want to board uh, an aircraft carrier, which I'll show you. It's coming up also. But uh, this was the, the iconic uh, aircraft of the Vietnam War, and the Army had a lot of them, uh, five or 6,000 of these things. Uh, and this was mainly a light attack gunship. had a turbo shaft engine, and uh, it was the first turbo shaft helicopter that entered Vietnam. Uh, it provided a, a air cover for transport helicopters. The helicopter we use, which I'll show you in a second here, uh, also for truck convoys, uh, truck fire support for uh, ground units, etc. They had a few slicks for VIP runs, but the, the Army had a lot of slicks, which they used for troop lifts and uh, medevacs. We didn't have that. We'll be showing you the one that we had. It had two uh, internal M60 machine guns and uh, four of them mounted on the outside of the aircraft, plus a couple of rocket pods here. Here it is looking from the front here. You can see the rocket pods, 2.75 inch rockets and four M60 machine guns. Uh, it was very effective. It helped us a lot in getting in and out of hot zones. It was just a great aircraft. Uh, uh, the pilots were great. They, these are the guys that the tracers come and they're flying towards them. And, uh, but they were way overused, as all the helicopters from the Marine Corps' point of view were. were uh, we were uh, restricted by budget, and, uh, a lot of other constraints, and we just didn't, uh, and we were behind in the whole process from the get-go of probably nine months to a year. And we just didn't have enough of them, and we were, not only the Huey, but all the other aircraft were overused, and these engines only had so much time on them, they were burnt out. So there was a lot of availability problems we had to deal with. And the Hueys were short, were short on Hueys, and they were a vital uh, part of the whole team. Here's a Huey on a rocket run right now. Here's from the cockpit of the pilot. All right. Um, here's an interesting aircraft. Anybody know what these are called? Yell it out. A Chinook? Right, that's what everybody said. Chinook. And it's understandable. Uh, this is actually the, the Boeing Vertol CH 46 C Knight, which is uh, the Marine Corps used. Uh, here's a Chinook. That's the Army's version. But it's understandable how you get mixed and must made by the same company. The Boeing Vertol CH 47 Chinook built uh, out of Philadelphia, and it's a P.S. Hackey aircraft design. Uh, Boeing bought P.S. Hackey, uh, another helicopter pioneer in the industry, and he uh, had the concept of this uh, tandem rotor system. Uh, now the CH-46, let's talk about the 47 real quickly. The 47 was much larger. If you saw them together, you'd know the difference. Much larger. They carried at least twice as much as the 47. Six. That was a heavy lift helicopter. The CH-46 is a medium lift, and uh, the medium lift could do multiple missions. Uh, the Marine Corps were trying to get an aircraft 
that uh, could do multiple missions fit on an aircraft carrier. In other words, get more compact cubic feet uh, you know, on that bird. And uh, so they went with the medium lift, and uh, you could get uh, 14 combat troops on there, U.S. combat troops, uh, and you could carry an external load of anywhere from three to 5,000 pounds. And by the way, uh, in South Vietnam, uh, you could only carry about 60% of the load you could in the States. And that's because what is known as uh, density altitude. Uh, it's rather than a big explanation, that the air over there, uh, due to the heat and humidity uh, and barometric pressure over there, uh, air was less dense. So there's less, you say, lift in the air. I mean, that's a simplified version. So you either need more power or you had to lighten the load. So. Uh, we lightened the load, so uh, you could put a squad of Marines on there, usually about a three to four squads in a platoon, and uh, that's where that worked. And uh, here the uh, 46 had the pilot sitting up here in the front, and you had a crew chief who moved all around the aircraft, and he's standing out back here, usually when you start the APU up uh, to power up, uh, he's looking for fire and all that sort of thing. But uh, he was essential in flying this aircraft. Uh, the pilots, you know, you could look out, you could only see out that far. He was, her eyes and ears everywhere else. And many times he had control of the aircraft verbally, uh, directing us in and out of zones or uh, a number of other situations. He had two turboshaft engines. Uh, this is an armor plate right here. And uh, fuel was contained in these cells down here in the stub wings. Uh, the, the engine powered a, a main transmission here in the rear of the tail section, and uh, which had a synchronizing shaft up here to the forward transmission. Because these, as you'll notice, these rotors, blades, or, or they intermesh, so you had to, didn't want them to bang up against each other. Uh, it also had a ramp, uh, so troops, medevacs, come on on the ramp and they exit the ramp. It really worked well from that point of view. Um, the two models, an A model and a D model. Uh, and the A model was under power. Uh, when I went to, through the, to be checked out in one of these back in the States, I flew the D model. When I got over there, I had the A model in the squadron. I had. One time, a 262 was all A models and eventually as through attrition, and battle damage and everything, the Ds they eventually got the Ds, but a lot of, there were a number of squadrons going over there with all Ds, and there was a 300 horsepower difference, which doesn't sound much, but it made a big difference, because if you had a heavy load, and uh, you were coming out or going into the zone, you could, uh, if you didn't have enough power, you, what would happen is something called drooping, and that is a sound you, you'll never forget, because it means your rotor, RPMs on your rotor are declining. And if it gets to a certain point, you're, you're coming down. It's a form of a stall. And um, uh, the A, you had to be very careful with that uh, because uh, there were a number of pilot air crashes because of it. Uh, they they didn't, couldn't, uh, didn't have the experience at the time, and uh, they misjudged. Whereas the D really solved most of it. That was a beautiful aircraft to fly. Now, uh, spending more time on the 46, not only because... Don and I flew these, but because it was a major component of our inventory. It made up 40% approximately of the helicopters that the Marine Corps used. Uh, it was a, a, the workhorse of the Marine Corps, because it could do so many things, uh, not just one thing or two things. Um, it uh, had one problem, though, uh, as I was just reporting to New River, North Carolina, to get checked out in one of these things, that was September of 1967. <clears throat> Prior to that, and at the time I was there, I had a little issue where the tail of this aircraft, approximately right through here, would disengage from the rest of the aircraft, fall off. And that can, that can ruin your whole day, believe me. And uh, a lot of fatalities because of that. And uh, they closed, they grounded them. They, they said, whoa, we gotta do something. So it's thank God we had the CH, the old venerable CH-34 over there, which was a very rugged, dependable, easy to maintain aircraft. Uh, 
So that had to stand in while these were repaired. So they determined what, they never came up with a single one source that caused this to happen other than it happened in the tail section. So they looked at a number of things, the engineers, so on and so forth. They decided, let's beef up the tail section, all the transmissions, et cetera. And also the ramp down there was an issue with the ramp being uh, needed to be re-engineered and strengthened. And uh, they sent uh, most of these over to Okinawa in Japan, over 100 of them to be modified. And uh, they got them all back by December of uh, 1968, thank God, because it was just in time for the 1968 Tet Offensive, which started in January, which was probably the most intense uh, uh, combat of the uh, entire Vietnam, Vietnam War. Uh, this aircraft, by the way, uh, served in Kuwait and Iraq and Afghanistan, was retired in 2014, uh, actually it happened between 2004 and 14 gradually, and it was replaced by the Bell Boeing uh, V-22 tilt-rotor aircraft. Now, all right, let me go to the next page here. Um, I'm showing you some of these things because they're pretty common to all the marine helicopters, all the helicopters. Uh, this is the what we call the office. Of, at one time, I knew what all this stuff was. <laughs> don't ask me now because I don't know what, where am I, what am I doing here? Uh, and the reason I'm showing this is because of these seats here, you can see a little welding thing here. Uh, the pilot sat in armored seats, which was a big, uh, uh, it was a comfort uh, because of, uh, uh, you know, obviously, it could stop uh, bullets from penetrating the pilots which was a major concern for the pilots. Uh, but uh, the, uh, oops, let me just, excuse me right here. Next up. Now here is uh, Don Esmond <laughs> modeling a flying outfit, uh, uh, getting aboard a CH-46. Don, you were really a good looking guy back then. What the hell happened, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, that's a great looking mustache there. Uh, Don here, the reason I'm showing this is he's wearing what is known as a bullet bouncer. And it weighed uh, over 20 pounds and it supposedly could stop a direct 50 caliber round. And I wouldn't want to test that out, I'll tell you that, but that's what they said. And uh, this little thing right here is a survival radio if he got shot down and Don, I'm sure he had to use that a couple of times. He's wearing his uh, Nomex flight suit, heat resistant. He's wearing his hard hat down here. And he's got another piece of equipment here, the sidearm. And most of the pilots carry the sidearm, not to fight the NVA with, but they use it uh, when they got it strapped in, they put that thing between their legs to protect a critical part of the anatomy. Uh, uh, by the way, here's another little thing. And I, I, I don't know if I'm explaining this right, correctly or not. But uh, the uh, maintenance people uh, had a sense of humor. And you see this number here, two and nine tenths. Uh, most of the uh, CH-46 had a whole number there, you know, one through whatever. Uh, that should have been three. And he was shot up uh, a lot in this particular aircraft that they didn't have. The metal that was lost represented about one tenth of the aircraft. So they put that number up just to joke around with a little bit. Uh, okay, just to show that I was young too at one time. Picture me, somebody snapped down on a flight line at, at Quang Tree. And I had hair under that hat at the time. Uh, this is a crew chief, uh, vital member of the team. And he, uh, whoops, wrong, I moved up too much here. He sat, this is one place he sat, but he moved all over the aircraft. and. Uh, this, by the way, is the, uh, we had two 50 caliber machine guns, the Browning M250 caliber machine guns, which had some heft to it. That thing could take down uh, trees. Here's the crew chief out the back, uh, start up. Here's a port gunner manning a, a machine gun. Uh, we also had a, what we call the, uh, uh, excuse me, the broom closet over here, which contained our hydraulic system. We had two systems and a uh, the, 
a stabilization augmentation system, which uh, helped the aircraft fly. The computer helped you fly a little precursor to uh, uh, the uh, autopilot. Uh, and over here was the uh, avionics closet, uh, and all the radios and nav aids and all that sort of thing. Okay, that, by the way, before I get on to that, all the, the flying uh, uh, over there, and I'm sure the Army went through this too, is a lot of what I call seat of the plan, seat of the pants, hands-on flying. But we were also supplemented by a lot of actual instrument flying, both day and night. Uh, over in Vietnam, uh, they had an IFR control system, military system, similar to the states. You have transponder, tell you, you know, altitude, direction, high, uh, speed, and all that sort of thing. And uh, uh, you had a nav A, in this case we used TACAN, which gave you distance and direction. I didn't have uh, glide slope information, so usually did a ground control approach into an airfield. Uh, you know, where they tell you if you're on a glide slope or left or right or so on and so forth. Uh, but into some of these zones we went into, there was no instruments. Uh, you were doing it seat of the pants, day and night, bad weather. Uh, it was uh, quite a challenge. Uh, but you got very good at it as time goes on. You were actually a co pilot or a hack in training. And uh, personally, I was lucky enough to fly with a lot of guys that flew during the siege of Tesa. Now this is uh, another aircraft uh, that we used, the Sikorsky CA-53 Sea Stallion. It had an A and a D model. And uh, this was our heavy lift helicopter. Uh, it uh, was a... Uh, uh, equipped two uh, turbo shaft engines. I keep pushing the wrong button, sorry folks. Never used this before. And uh, the A model was a, naturally less powerful than the D model. The A model had about 5,700 uh, shaft horsepower coming off those two engines. And the D model went up to 7,850. This thing could carry a lot of stuff. Uh-oh, I did something, Greg. Did I push the bad, did I push the bad button? I got it. Oh, never mind. Um, and uh, it had the same crew structure as the 46. 250 caliber machine guns, crew chief, two gunners, etc. Uh, now, the, when the CH 53 got here in May of 1967, uh, it got off to a slow start. It had, uh, they had, uh, the suppliers were slow in getting uh, parts, uh, and uh, so it made it cause some availability problems, and uh, the. Uh, they were expensive to maintain. They were really a sophisticated aircraft. And uh, uh, they were restricted by the air wing uh, going into hot zones. And boy, the pilots and the crews of those aircraft did not like that. But later on, these issues were ironed out. And they were a big help because they carry a lot more, way more than the C-46 could. Um, uh, now, the C-53 is still in service today in the Marine Corps although much upgraded as three engines and eight rotor blades, and uh, it uh, could uh, do in-flight refueling even. All right, let me show you. The first one's a resupply, although it also could be napalm in there. They had a, they created their own little uh, uh, assault aircraft there. They get over a target and release one side of that sling and drop the cans of gasoline down there, and then the Hueys would come in and set them off. Um, but that could be resupplied, looks the same thing. Troop lifts, uh, and also uh, aircraft retrieval was a big thing. They were powerful enough. Here's a Huey being retrieved, and believe me, I took a, a lot of duct tape to put that back together, but it was not too good. Now here I'm showing you a, a, a fixed wing aircraft. This is North American Rockwell OV-10 Bronco. Pretty little aircraft there. Uh, the reason I show you this is because they were assigned to Huey squadrons, believe it or not. They're a multi-purpose observation light attack aircraft, short takeoff and landing, do that in 800 feet. They were assigned to Huey squadrons and uh, they also escorted helicopters. Now I got to work with these a little bit towards the end of my uh, tour in Vietnam. 
and they took some pressure off the Huey. So that was a, a welcome uh, addition. And uh, they could, they had uh, four M60 machine guns, and uh, they had a number of uh, weapons packages they could hook onto this thing. Was, they were 2.75 inch rockets. They had sideminder missiles. Could uh, mount a 20 millimeter cannon even. Uh, but uh, uh, they helped. Here's one on a rocket run right now. All right. Okay, moving on to the Bell AH-1G Cobra. Uh, this uh, entered Vietnam in March of 1969. I never got to work with any of these. Uh, never even saw one, quite frankly. Now, we got 38 of these from the Army, the hand-me-downs. The Army had them at least a year ahead of us. Again, the Army uh, uh, had the latest of everything. And uh, we were always sort of on the end of the line come the budgeting and that sort of thing. Uh, but that's not to disparage the Army. The Army was a great organization, especially their, art, their helicopters. And they deserved these things because they operated in a much larger area. And uh, uh, they needed them to complete their missions. We did too, but we're always short and overused and uh, understaffed. We're also short of helicopter pilots and crews. Uh, the, uh, the maintenance people working 24-7 today to keep these things flying. And boy, I tell you, some of these uh, aircraft uh, were patched together. Uh, anyway, this is the, uh, the Cobra. Let me go here. Uh, this uh, had two pilots tandem. It had a pilot in the back and a co-pilot gunner in the front. And it had a uh, much uh, uh, stronger uh, weapon system uh, down here on the uh, Front, they have a turret, they have a 20 millimeter cannon, and a Gatling gun down here. They could carry all sorts of uh, assortments of rockets. And it was a single engine turbine shaft. And uh, we were glad to get these. And uh, there was another modified version of this coming up uh, later on. And uh, here's an artist rendering of a Cobra's escorting. Matter of fact, helicopters from our squadron see HMM 262 and a assault, probably a troop lift. I, to me, that that's the artist's imagination there. You normally don't see that unless they have fixed wing dropping napalm, as from my experience. So, but it looks good, doesn't it? Uh, all right. Now, I was talking about Marine Corps. The Army system was uh, designed sort of a cavalry situation. They even wore the cavalry hats and that sort of thing. Uh, but we were initially off of uh, helicopter uh, aircraft carriers. And uh, here's a USS Tripoli. Uh, we call them an LPHs, landing platform helicopters. And uh, they were basically a World War II helicopter at that time, straight deck. And see a bunch of 46s aboard. Uh, they could also get some 53s on here and a few Hueys. They carried about a, a battalion of Marines on there, so you could go anywhere uh, and uh, to be the, f the first strike into an area uh, or an emergency situation. And uh, there's always two or three of these cruising somewhere in the world, like the Mediterranean or the Caribbean. And uh, this uh, is a, through the windscreen of a 46 making an approach to the helicopter. Now, here you are down in the hangar deck. And now you see why, uh, being, uh, what you, what, how these aircraft have to be designed to fit on an aircraft carrier, because here's uh, some CH-34s with the folded wings. You had to fold these things. The tail section, fixed wing had the same thing, if you recall. Um, here's the CH-46s on board. And one of the reasons that we didn't go with the CH-47, my understanding is, uh, is that they found, uh, Sikorsky found that to redesign that rotor head uh, to do this was so expensive it wasn't worth it. So that's why uh, one of the reasons we went with the Sikorsky, although it turned out to be a great aircraft. Uh, okay, next. Here's 53s on board, folded, tail folded. Uh, you don't see any, to show you any Hueys because you don't have to fold those. You got one rotor blade, 
north and south. I, I'm not sure if the tail section folded or not. I don't recall. Any Huey pilots there? Uh, okay. All right, quick geography. This is South Vietnam broken up into uh, what they call core tactical zones. And uh, the Marines were up here and I Corps were responsible for them. They were operated on Da Nang, the, the uh, third Marine Air amphibious force. Don't worry about it. You don't have to remember that. But the first and third Marine divisions were up here, first out of uh, the Dang, third up here in the Dong Ha area, and the first Marine Air Wing, which had uh, three fixed wing uh, air groups and three helicopter air groups. The Army supplemented us in the, uh, initially in the two southern uh, provinces of uh, I Corps, we call, we call it I Corps. And um, which helped out. They eventually helped us out because we just didn't have enough helicopters and uh, uh, to cover what we had to cover. Here is the northern part of uh, I Corps, and really the major operation of the Marines were right in here. The, they went a little bit off this map down here. Don, you've probably done some of those when you're at Marble, uh, but uh, the major locations of the helicopter groups were here in Da Nang and Marble Mountain and Phu Bai and up here in Quang Tri. Our squadron, HMM-262, uh, operated out of Quang Tri. Don uh, had also operated out of Marble Mountain afterwards. They uh, relocated. Uh, up here, some of the most contentious battles of the, the war. You had the battle for way up here. This all happened, most of it, uh, in the uh, Tet Defense of 1968. In 1967, there was a lot of uh, heavy combat up here in the Khan Tien area, so basically the, in the, uh, uh, the lowland areas. And then you got Quezon over here, right close to the low ocean border, where the siege of Quezon happened, one of the epic battles. That and Hoi or taught in Marine Corps. University uh, to this day. All right, here was our operating area for HMM-262 Pacey. Although we were assigned uh, to go missions down in the Fubai area or down to Da Nang occasionally, but most of the time, and most of my uh, flight experience happened here, uh, from Quang Tri all the way over to Quezon, Laos, and further south off the map, uh, they had other operations on the Ashaw Valley and the Tacrong Valley. Uh, here's the DMZ up here. It was four to six miles wide by about 45 miles long. Uh, Quang Tree City is right down here. Uh, Dong Ha was up here. Dong Ha was a supply depot area. The ships would come up here and they'd be offloaded on barges and they'd uh, float down here. And then uh, most of the supplies at that time were taken out by truck. Uh, and they, up to Quezon. And uh, the Marines uh, supplied areas that couldn't be supplied by truck. This, uh, 1967 was a heavy area, Con Tien, they used to call that leather, Leatherneck Square. Uh, that's where we first, you know, the 46s got their first experience, mainly right in there. Uh, and then you get out to Quezon and the hills around Quezon, you need helicopters for that. And eventually, uh, Quezon, this road here was cut off by the NVA. The, the, this, this road, Highway 9 this is called by the way, Highway 1 here, but this went all the way down to Saigon. Uh, this went over into Laos. You can call them roads, they were really dirt paths basically. And it was, this was cut off and uh, so the truck traffic couldn't get up to Quezon anymore and they used fixed wing aircraft, C-130, C-123s. And then eventually uh, the artillery uh, and the anti-aircraft guns that they set up there prevented them from going in uh, even then. They had to do airdrops. And the hills, though, had no source of resupply and support other than helicopters. All right, flying conditions. Talk about the topography here. Uh, do this quickly. This is a, a North and South Vietnam. Vietnam. This is the Annamite Mountain Range. And uh, down in our area from from the DMZ on down, these mountains, they call them the small mountains or big big hills, they ranged anywhere from 2,000 to 5,000 feet. And uh, then you had the coastal plains 
right along here, the flat areas, uh, out to the uh, Gulf of Tonkin and also the uh, South China Sea, and then you get down to the Mekong Delta. Saigon was located down there. All right. Here's a little version, uh, a zoom in, so to speak. Quang Cree was over here, and uh, Dong Ha, Kaysan up here. And you can see, uh, again, the, the brown, the darkness of it indicated the altitude. You can notice all those streams and things uh, around here. And at times when you had bad weather, if you couldn't get in going up above and find a hole to go down through, you would come down low level down these streams and valleys. And after flying up there for nine months or so, you, you knew that place like the back of your hands. And a lot of the flying and the bad weather and the monsoon air season or the bad weather at times, uh, it's like flying down a tunnel, you know. Uh, so you got some interesting experiences. Here's a picture of what they call the highlands. You can see they're sort of like the foothill areas around here. Uh, you can see the streams. This is on the way up to Quezon. There is Quezon, as a matter of fact. There's a strip hard to see right there. Laos is right over there. And this was the, the fix where mainly made approaches through here. You can see all the craters and everything around here. Well, uh, this was bombed, significantly bombed because of the anti aircraft guns the NVA had set up. By the, by the way, the NVA, that's an acronym for the North Vietnamese Army. And that's, Arvins for the South Vietnamese NVA. And uh, here is the, uh, uh, give you an example of the uh, coastal plain area. Uh, you can see how flat it is. This is looking directly uh, west. It's even tank country. This is looking from Dong Ha up to the DMZ up here, Qua Viet River here. And uh, they had a, look like a morning rocket attack, which happened periodically. Same thing down at our base, Quang Tree. Uh, here's the ground cover. This was triple canopy, mainly in the mountains, there's not so much, not in the uh, coastal plains. Triple canopy, they tell me if you get in here, you sometimes you couldn't even see the, your hand in front of your face. And it was, a, I'd call it a forest slash jungle. And uh, in the jungle and all that area around there, they had 37 varieties of poisonous snakes, including king cobra. They had uh, uh, all kinds of uh, animals, things like that. They even had, uh, up in the uh, case on there, they had tigers. One Marine was killed by a tiger during my tour there, and they had another one carried off, was dropped. I guess the tiger lost his appetite after a while, luckily for that Marine. Uh, now here's a land, we're talking about landing zones now, the type of landing zones we had, and they're all different kinds. And here's one up here on a ridge line, and uh, I you might ask if you ever saw a landing zone, uh, is how in the hell did they get that landing zone up here when all of this heavy terrain, where they walk up there, how they, you couldn't land a helicopter in this stuff. Well, uh, usually it's done by an airstrike, and in a lot of cases by what are, dropping what is known as a daisy cutter, which is a 15,000 pound bomb that would clear enough room for a helicopter to get in, and sometimes helicopters dropped them. Uh, hovered over the air and dropped the bomb. And uh, so it's big enough for 46 to get in. Here's a, a zone, uh, you get a zone like that, 46 comes in, drops off enough troops to form a uh, defensive perimeter. And then they bring in the guys with the chainsaws of ha axes and they start expanding that zone and preparing it. Obviously something's wrong here because this thing is sitting down, closed down. I don't know why. I never have found out the answer to that because they have the door down, everybody's standing around. Couldn't be a hot zone. They wouldn't be doing that. Uh, there's a dropping off a load in the zone. A irregular. Some of them were easier than others. Here's a zone, a rock pile, they called it. Uh, I forget the altitude of this thing, but it's a, it was an army listing post to determine the movement of the NVA, uh, unbeknownst to most people, including myself when I was over there. Uh, the Air Force dropped all kinds of these different sensors throughout the area, to, and they could detect movement and even pick up conversations. I didn't know that. But they listened in for that stuff. And this is on a little pad there. You could put your rear wheels down there, let people get on and off, on and off. But then, you know, when you do an external load, you have to put it right on that pad. So those A models, you better have that, that right, although the, being steep as it is, you had to pickle that load. You could 
dive off to the side to pick up airspeed to get out of that drooping situation. Here's a, this is an artillery site which covered, in addition to, to your air support, you had artillery support. You had all the howitzers down here, 105s usually. Here's the landing pad. Uh, you can see they spent a lot of time preparing this zone here. Uh, here's an easy zone to get in, big open area, elephant grass. Whoop, elephant grass in here. Uh, and uh, those are easy to get in and out as long as the, the martyrs and the, and the uh, tracers went flying their way. Uh, here's a, a well-prepared zone. Uh, I bring it up, it's Hill 881. It's actually Hill 81 South, which uh, is another epic, uh, it's part of the case, uh, the siege case, but an epic fighting happened here on this hill. Uh, that 400 Marines up there, half of them uh, were, uh, 40 of them were killed and uh, over 200 uh, wounded. Of course, they replaced them, but that was a, that's taught in Marine Corps school also nowadays. But uh, this is looking, I believe, south. Uh, and uh, one thing about this one, I keep pushing the wrong button, is you don't see any craters or anything around. So this is in the early days. But you, during the siege, after you know about two, going on three months, this is what the areas look like after heavy combat. Uh, air strikes. <laughs> uh, uh, and this is a landing uh, zone also. This is Quezon Combat Base, uh, the heart of the siege of Quezon. And uh, matter of fact, those puffs of smoke are some sort of incoming. That's not artillery there. It's too small, probably mortars. or I don't know, if, I don't know that that would be rockets. But uh, we came in there too. They even had revetments here. Uh, we'd land and spend overnight there, but eventually they couldn't even do that. Uh, fixed wind couldn't enter anymore because of the heavy anti-aircraft uh, air, fire, and they dr dropped their supplies in by air. Uh, some of the supplies went to the NVA. Uh, but it was another paradise up there. Here's, I know how Tartar got this picture. They had to be just snapping it, because you don't wait, oh, here comes an artillery rod, and hold it, and you click. So. Uh, that's the type of stuff they put in. They'd get hundreds of rounds every day during that 70-day siege. And then one day in February, they had 1,300 rounds hit, hit the uh, base. Here's another one. And the reason I'm showing this is a uh, little give you a little hint of the weather. This is uh, showing a, a ceiling here, uh, right here over case. And I, I don't know, I'm going to say it's about 200 feet. And Quezon was on a plateau, it was about 900 to 1,000 feet. So if you extended that back to Pine Tree, up to the west, that means you'd have 1,200 feet out there. So, oh, what's the problem? Uh, no problem, you could get out here underneath if you wanted to. Uh, but the hills that we had to support uh, were up, tops of these were up in this fog, these mountains. And the fog would roll in in the morning and uh, could clear up a little bit in the afternoon, depending on the time of the year. And uh, that made supplying those hills very difficult, and that part of the siege was the resupply of those hills and very bad weather. Uh, speaking of the weather, uh, this one I need my notes on, excuse me. Uh, well, anyway, it, uh, I have a note here I gotta have, but I can't tell you about the weather. Bear with me. Lost my place. All right. A couple of different weather uh, situations. April through October over there. Can you still hear me? April through October. It was very hot. 90s to the 100. Very humid. And um, the Marines on the ground had to... Uh, deal with uh, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, that sort of thing. One time when they first got over there, they weren't used to it. Probably 30% of the casualties was heat exhaustion, heat stroke. Uh, it was so hot there that when we came back, 
uh, from behind. Uh, we take off our clothes, just walk around in undershirts. Uh, there wasn't too, uh, discipline, uniform discipline wasn't enforced over there. But it was hot and uh, difficult from that point of view. But it was especially hard for these guys, the Marines out there. This is where I uh, woke up at times. Over the march, it's the foggy, rainy, poor visibility season. That's why the NVA usually conducted major assaults during those periods because it made it more difficult uh, to use our helicopters and air support. Fixed wing air support for uh, Also, during that rainy or bad weather season, you had the monsoons, uh, which uh, came in between November. And uh, by the way, this is Hill 881 South again. This is what, a, what it looked like in the morning out there. So, getting in, uh, some people attempted and succeeded in air attaching up the side of the hill, which is a very difficult thing to do because you need a helicopter to hover, you need a point of reference. I don't care who you are, whatever. You, you don't have a point of reference, you can't hover that thing. You, you can start going sideways and not even know it. Uh, so some people are successful at it. I've tried it a few times, it was successful, but a number of times I just couldn't do it. Um, but anyway, going on to the monsoons. Here's Quang Tree uh, Air Base uh, before the monsoon. That's where we were located. It's a stair strip right there, probably about not quite 4,000 feet. Could take large aircraft could take about a uh, fixed wing with C-130. But anyway, that's before the monsoon. Here's after the monsoon. Uh, they get uh, during that period 64 inches annually up there. Uh, so a lot of water. As a matter of fact, here's our living uh, areas down in uh, in the base. And it washed out a whole area. By the way, you'll notice the terrain here. It's on sand. The sand is like a beach. It went all the way, you know, probably in 10 miles. And uh, here's the sand. By the way, you also got your food and everything else. Uh, but uh, here's our bunker. All the Hoochies pilots got together and built our own bunkers. I don't know we, how many sandbags are there, but we spent two months building that damn thing in the heat before we knew anything about a monsoon, no one mentioned that you needed uh, drainage. So, uh, so this thing had to be totally destroyed, torn out, rebuilt. Uh, so what can I tell you? You know, it sounds like, oh, it poor us, the pilots, and it was dangerous flying helicopters. But nothing but these guys would do it. Talking about missions, here's uh, troop inserts and extractions. Uh, we did multiple missions, as I said. Here they are picking up anywhere from a company to a battalion of Marines, taking them out here. We're taking the happy grunts to work. And here's a, a flight of CH-46s, probably it could be an 8 12 uh, for the, the 12 aircraft going into a zone, it could be coming out of a zone. Now this is an interesting picture, it shows a CH-46 disembarking these Marines into a zone, and you notice that the uh, the gear, not on the ground, uh, this one may be touching over there, I'm not sure, but uh, uh, these Marines are coming off before you land, and uh, well, the most vulnerable part uh, flying one of these things uh, when you're doing troop lifts, is the approach, uh, the landing, and the takeoff because you're slow. Uh, no getting around it. And so, what would happen uh, in a hot zone, the crew chief would have these Marines standing up when you're probably 15 feet up and facing backwards, and the ramp would start coming down about 10 feet, and the crew chief would start yelling, Go, go, go! and be pushing these guys, and they'd come off the back end. And then you just, if it went, Perfectly, your wheels were just touching you. He'd call clear and you'd nose it over and get the hell out of there. Uh, to spend any time in a zone, uh, in a hot zone, was bad news. And that's usually when you got hit. And uh, you didn't want to spend over 60 seconds, it was a lifetime in a hot zone because the martyrs come in. You always keep their heads down for a while, but you know they got that 
cycle. They got to fly, and then there are some gaps, and then the guy can drop that mortar down the tube. Uh, and that's uh, not what you want to have. Now here's another zone at a land with the wheels. And a lot of people say, oh my god, I, this is one of the easiest maneuvers you could do. Uh, nothing to that. Here's, here we are picking the Marines up. What was uh, difficult is hovering over a, a wooded area and dropping a sling down for a medevac and hovering there exposed for minutes. That, that was rather unnerving. Uh, here we are, resupply, vital to these hills. And here we are, we took those up externally, probably out of Donghar, it could be a place called uh, Kalu, which was later named Vandekrift Combat Base. And they're hooking these things up underneath the helicopter, or carried in these slings. And uh, uh, inside, the crew chief is down, laying on his stomach, looking through a hatch, directing the piles, you know, up, down, left, right. Uh, couldn't operate with them. Now here he is, uh, C-46 delivering a load in his own. This is Hill, uh, as I recall, 861, uh, up there by Quezon at two, two levels, better than the lower level, better cover. But you can see how exposed you are coming in because you've got that big sling down there, and if you're in a hot zone, that, uh, that was a difficult thing to do. Most of the time, you didn't have to take resupply into a hot zone. They could wait, but it got so bad up there with the weather uh, at a time, uh, the hills weren't resupplied for about three weeks. They had a, they had a big uh, operation to get those guys resupplied. Uh, you know, water, next thing, ammunition water, two most important things you need to survive on those hills. We also did what is known as recon inserts and extracts. These guys here were, I guess you'd call them special forces of the Marine Corps, you know, like the Green Berets for the Army of the Seals. Uh, uh, they uh, they were something else. Uh, they operated four to, to eight man teams, and uh, their job uh, mainly was to go out. We drop them in a clearing by a ridge line. They go in there and they they find the NVA uh, quietly, hopefully, uh, not be detected. Assess their strength and everything. Call for an extract. Come out and get out. Uh, we pick them up at a clearing and then report back so that uh, assault could be uh, arranged uh, maybe the next day. But uh, I'd say, I don't know, Don, you tell me 40% of the time they made contact with the NBA. So they were a fighting retreat out of these areas and carrying wounded and sometimes the dead. And it got so bad at times they had to bring in additional recon teams to help get it out. And uh, so it got pretty hairy. These guys were amazing. Uh, and it, uh, it triply difficult night doing one of these. They had calling flare ships and everything. Believe me, uh, only been on a few of those, and I don't. I, that to me was probably one of the most dangerous. Here we are taking them out, uh, and here they are disembarking, dropping them off. I'm sure there's a tree line close by. This is a clearing. That's uh, elephant grass dropping to uh, get up ten feet high. Here they are coming off the back. Then we had to go pick them up when they called to be retrieved. Here's, looks like four, there's five men there, and uh, they're signaling to come on in. This to me, uh, you can see the tree line there, but this doesn't look like an open clearing. This looks like a shelf. This aircraft, uh, 46 is probably backing into it, and you definitely need a crew chief for that to make sure your, your rotors blades cleared any obstacles. Uh, Medivacs. Now here's one I try not to choke up on. Both day and night, that's probably the most gratifying mission uh, for a helicopter pilot. And uh, this is during a rainy season, obviously you can see the mud and everything. Uh, pretty ugly at times. Now uh, here's a uh, Navy corpsman giving first aid to a, to a wounded Marine out in the field. And, uh, well, I can't say enough about these Navy corpsmen. Here they are, bringing them on board. Here we had also in Medivac, you're assigned a Navy corpsman. By the way, you had, that was your duty. They had the day Medivacs and the night Medivacs, and you were assigned, you just 
stayed in the ready room until you were called upon to come out for a medevac. And uh, here he is uh, giving additional aid, stabilizing these guys, and he would direct you to where to go. Uh, uh, there's the, the intermediate type aid stations on the way to the hospital, say in Quang Tree, or the hospital ship. And uh, this is an intermediate, this is probably a case on a bunker, uh, underground bunker. And the reason I say that is these guys are wearing these, wearing their hard hats and flak vests. And uh, they, because of all the artillery incoming they took there and they're giving uh, additional aid, there could be somebody right there from the base. And uh, here they are at the hospital uh, and uh, administering triage, determining who needs what, uh, you know, what uh, procedure to be done. Now here's the, one of the hospital ships, or two of those at all times off the coast uh, in our area, uh, up by us and one down by the Da Nang area. And this is where they would send people for more sophisticated treatments, yeah, operations, etc. And it had a uh, back here uh, uh, landing pad on the back end of the ship. That's not a naval term. I forgot what it was. Here's a C-34 making an approach to the landing pad. There's a 46 on there. But not to that ship many a times in all kinds of weather. Also because it had a tack and beacon on it. It gives you direction uh, and the distance, which was very helpful in finding that ship. Now, here's another tough one, uh, returning our fallen Marines home. Now, this was not a uh, an assigned mission. Uh, you would get a call, say, if you're on resupply or doing some other mission, a troop lift or something, they'd ask, you get a call, could you pick up five KIAs at such and such place? And uh, KIA stands for killed in action. And by the way, the, uh, uh, that's what I'm talking about, choking up. Uh, when you were there, uh, you became desensitized to all of this, and uh, KIA was an indication of that. Your brain tries to protect you, and it takes you quite a while to get these feelings. Anyway, by the way, here was one the typical thing you see of a Marine a field covered by his poncho until he's picked up, and here they are. This is probably a, could be Quezon, could be Fubai, could be Quang Tree, I don't know, but they're eventually end up down in the Da Nang area and repair and sent home. Uh, now I want to show you a little bit about the purpose, our whole purpose being there to support our Marines on the ground and our other allies there. Now, these are just random pictures. I could give you a hundred of them, but uh, that's, we don't have time for it. You can see the conditions they lived in. Now, obviously things must have simmered down here. These guys are sitting up with their heads up. I don't know where this is. I thought it was the perimeter of Quezon. Could be Here's a little uh, Marine Corps humor. Quezon may be hazardous to your health. It's funny, Quezon was a bad place. The guys up in the hill, the CO up there, like 881 South, once in a while, a guy's been up there for quite a while, been through quite an experience. He'd send them to Quezon for their R&R. &R. Can you believe it? Two days in Quezon. Do uh, you think this Marine could use a little R&R and &R maybe a bath? Uh, the conditions. Eight eighty one South. Uh, here's guys. It looks like a World War One trench warfare. You, know, you had to get down. You had to get low, uh, and uh, you can see the weather too here. Uh, here they are, and uh, they're down. They're below. They got cover. Uh, they did most of their work, like retrieving supplies and re, you know, alarming and all that sort of thing at night because of snipers, etc. A lot of martyr. That sort of thing in the daytime. Uh, so they stayed low. Now this is a this is an interesting one. Uh, when they prepared the zone and everything, they didn't have enough time for everyone to build bunkers, and they had what they called uh, bunny holes. And these guys didn't even have a bunker to, to sleep in. So here they are sleeping in the daytime. Look at this. I mean, you can't take a bath. You know, it's, it's just terrible conditions. They had a, a this was on the 881 South again, and the CEO of that company up there, India Company, uh, would uh, rotate as many as he could into the command bunker so they could sleep there. 
otherwise. If this were some of their roommates, uninvited, uh, that they had to deal with at night, they'd come out you know, all over the place, running over the bodies and everything. I even had one of these run over me and my living in a hooch came across my face, and that was the most scared I ever was in the whole war. I just woke up the woke up the whole hooch. It must have had ten guys in there. What happened? You know? And uh, I said something fuzzy walked across my head. I, uh, there had to be one of those things. But uh, they would have sleeping on their chest. And, uh, they're trying to find food. Uh, now here was a very uh, uh, smart uh, Navy corpsman devised a way to get rid of some of these roommates. <laughs> he had a, found a piece of pipe and created a blow dart system. And someone asked him if uh, did he ever get any of these rats? And he said, well, I've had six confirmed and one probable. So, now, finally, we come uh, to uh, uh, what I call phase three of the war, uh, June 1971 to August 1973. By June 1971, the Marines were totally out of uh, Vietnam, South Vietnam proper. And uh, the Army was still there up until August of 1973. But the Marines uh, were available for offshore support. They were within four to seven days uh, away by ship. And uh, they were called back a couple of times. And one of the times during this period was called the Easter Fence of 1972, uh, when the NVA came across with about 60,000 NVA. And that happened uh, in. Uh, Sorry, right here, let me get my uh, bearings. Uh, it was 1972 Easter Offensive. I don't know why I can't seem to find that. They came across and they got down as far as way. And uh, Marines had sailed back. By the time they got there, they were down the way, uh, the, R the NVA. And uh, so uh, we went in to help uh, the 46s, 53s. Uh, Hueys uh, and uh, Army had their some of their forces up there and they pushed them all the way back up north of Dong Ha. Uh, it was a, really a defeat for them. Uh, they, they had heavy casualties by them, the NVA. And uh, they uh, uh, but they did maintain uh, some land up there by the DMZ which was some advancement but it was a, actually a loss for them. Also during this period was another operation uh, conducted by Marines up, up in North Vietnam, off the coast of uh, Northern Vietnam, right off of Haiphong Harbor. It was called uh, Operation Marhuk. It was uh, uh, conducted by only seven uh, the Bell AH-1J Sea Cobra. It's a J-Mon. And uh, they interdicted small boats that were, were ferrying uh, supplies off of Chinese and uh, Soviet ships into Haiphong Harbor because Haiphong Harbor was mined, the small boats could get through. And they uh, took out about 23 of those. They also attacked truck convoys. And they escorted Jolly Green Giants, uh, that's the Air Force rescue helicopter, in for, to pick up downed pilots. Uh, this, the difference between this and the G, the, uh, the main obvious difference is that it had two engines. Uh, the the uh, G model had one, and that was for safety over water. If you lost an engine, you could, uh, you could still make it back to the ship. And it had a, a beefed up uh, package, uh, weapons package also, which I won't get into, but it was just pretty awesome compared to the uh, old Huey. Um, also during that period, uh, the Paris peace negotiations were going on, and uh, they uh, finally uh, signed the, the Paris peace accords, uh, I think it was March 1973, somewhere it was in there, and uh, as part of that, the Marines were tasked with the responsibility 
uh, between uh, January 73 to March 1973 of uh, getting rid of neutralizing the mines in Haiphong Harbor. And in exchange for that, they released our POWs. And so uh, the CH 53s and 40s assisted in neutralizing them. 53s with nets would tow those things out of the way. And they, I think they fired on some of them and destroyed them that way. But uh, that resulted in the release of uh, our POWs. And so by August of 1973, all U.S. troops were out, except for our embassy staff and security, Marine security uh, forces over there. The only thing the uh, South Vietnamese were getting then from us was the uh, financial aid of about a billion dollars a year. And uh, this ended the uh, so-called Vietnamization process. Uh, by the way, this is what the, those uh, J models flew off of, off of uh, Haiphong Harbor. That's called an LPD, a uh, landing plan for platform dock. They only had seven of them at the time. All right, here we go. Now, uh, the final phase was obviously the evacuation of Saigon, which the Marines uh, participated in. Not only participated, they were really the main actor in there as far as evacuating uh, Saigon. I call it the beginning of the end. Uh, we can forget uh, the number seven. I could have taken that out of there. But August of 1974, anyone can remember that, uh, anyone here is old enough to remember, President Richard Nixon does, uh, resigns due to Watergate. And uh, Gerald Ford becomes the president. Uh, then in September of 74, uh, the war was, people were tired of the war. They were very unpopular by then. So Congress cuts the aid to South Vietnam from $1 billion to $700 million. And also, no, no more air support for the armies. They were on their own. They had a million men in uniform. Uh, they had uh, uh, their own uh, helicopters, had their own fixed wing. And so uh, we were out of there. But the NVA then again sees this as an opportunity to end it. And at this, this time, they were correct. So in March of 75, they started their final assault. And uh, they're making pretty good progress. Uh, President Ford went to Congress and requested another emergency $300 million to help the South Vietnamese hold, but they were, they were totally to turned down. They didn't want to give another dime for this, uh, which I don't have any proof of this, but to me was a, the final signal to the leadership of uh, the South Vietnamese government that this was it time to get out of Dodge. And when their leadership collapsed, so did all the rest of the troops, the Arvin troops, and they made a run for Saigon. It was a rout. Um, now, this is uh, the last phase, April 29th to April 30th of 1975, the evacuation of Saigon. It was called Operation Frequent Wind, and it started in before light. Uh, October 29th. Off ships offshore, uh, CH-53, CH-46s, backed up by uh, some UH-1Es and uh, the Cobra aircraft. And uh, why this happened, why the helicopters had to get out is interesting also because NVA were on the outskirts of Saigon and they shelled Tonsonut uh, International Airport, which would, would have been a place to evacuate as many people as possible, uh, because you could get big fixed-wing aircraft in there, C-5As, C-141s. Well, they shelled the, the airstrip, created all these craters, so fixed-wing couldn't get in. So they scrambled to find the biggest helicopters to find, 53, 46. The Army's gone. They didn't have helicopters that I know of that, uh, left there. To, and they were on, hel on aircraft carriers. So uh, this is what they used, 46s and 53s. Now this is a CAA helicopter on top of uh, a landing pad on a building and all these people coming up in. What's interesting about this is that this was labeled all over the country. It was on the front page, magazines, etc. last helicopter out of Vietnam or something to that effect. Here's the New York Daily News. As an example, and this was not the last helicopter out of Vietnam. This was a CAA 
uh, slick, uh, unmarked helicopter landing at a, above apartment building in downtown Saigon, which was housing uh, CIA personnel. There. That's what that was. Uh, it was the embassy. Everybody thought that was on the embassy. It, it was. It was. Here. And because uh, we had uh, uh, a big aircraft in, one of less exposure, we had to go into the parking lot down here. We had to cut some trees down, so we get CH-53s in. There's some pictures at the embassy of the embassy staff getting out. We, we took out about a thousand people. The embassy staff there. Here's out of Tansanut, uh, a Marine security guard there, and uh, that's where most of the evacuees came out of. Uh, they had uh, they took out six to seven thousand people out of there, many as they could, and. Uh, Here's 46. Now, on April 30th, 1975, just after about 18 hours of flying, last helicopters out of Vietnam. The first one was a CH-46 from HMM-165, lifts off embassy ground, embassy ground with the U.S. ambassador and staff at 4.58 in the morning. And the last helicopter uh, left, lifted with the Marine security forces. It naturally, it makes some sense. Out of Saigon, probably out of Thompson, at 7.53 in the morning on April 30th, in a CH-46 D mile from HMM-164. And uh, that was the story of the war. Uh, sad ending, uh, I know, but uh, I know one thing. Our, and this is part I tried not to choke up about. Our Marine soldiers, airmen, and sailors of our armed forces did not lose the war from a military point of view, no matter what the media is portrayed or is still portraying. Uh, we did not quit, but were ordered to leave uh, by our civilian superiors. And so we did. Uh, personally, uh, you know, serving there, you hope that your efforts weren't in vain, but I take comfort in the thought that maybe our helicopter missions helped the Marines our allies on the ground. And that is basically it. And with that, uh, I'll open it to questions. Well, thank you again, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen.